Let me ask a question. Who would like to see more people in church? All right, now that's a serious question now, so I'm going to ask it again. How many would like to see more people in church? Now, let me ask another question. How many here would like to see more souls saved? Raise your hand again. If you really want to see souls saved, would you raise your hand a little bit higher? Okay. How many would like to see their loved ones saved? Do you have unsaved loved ones? How many would like to see your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors saved? Do you have some unsaved ones like that? How many here, now this is probably the most serious question that I'll ask. How many here would like to be the one that wins that person to the Lord? Would you raise your hand? Now, see, that, that is a very serious question. And I do believe that God is watching right now to see who feels that way. Who wants to see souls saved? Amen? Now, I know it, it's a little bit late in the afternoon, and y'all had lunch, and, and so you start to get a little bit sleepy, and it's a little bit warm in here. At least it's warm up here. And uh, <laughs> I see some that are bundling up. But... Uh, but, you know, I would really like for us to get serious for just a few minutes. Uh, if winning souls is not important to us, then we're wasting our time here. We are absolutely wasting our time. Our theme for the evangelism work this year Going along with our regional theme of go is go and win souls for Christ. Go and win souls for Christ. Now, what does it sound like to you when you hear somebody saying, go, go, go? What does that sound like to you? First of all, it sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> you, have you ever noticed that? If you've ever heard somebody say that, if you've ever been walking down the street, or maybe you're in the Wally world, and you're going down the aisle, and you hear somebody going, go, 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 what are you going to do? You're going, what's going on over there? You're going to take a look and see. Because that sounds like something exciting, doesn't it? That's what that exclamation point's all about. It's an exclamation. The statement itself is an exclamation. And I think it's just as fitting to go after our second statement, and that is, and win souls for Christ. Oh, praise the Lord. That needs to be exciting to us. That needs to be something that gets our attention. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to take a look at some things here. I want us to understand that winning souls, our purpose the, for the church of God, is to win and keep souls for Christ. Now, this here is not just a statement that I came up with in the last month or two or the last couple of months since the regional convention. We introduced this at the regional convention. But this is actually what I've come to understand to be our purpose as the church of God, as the body of Christ, this is our purpose. This is taking everything that God has given us. If you got your Bible, would you hold it up for just a sec? Okay. You're going to need your Bible in a minute because I'm not going to give you the scriptures. I'm going to make you work. All right. God has given us his word. It's our instruction book. It has give, he give, he's given us everything that we need in order to know what it is that we are to do. Amen. Everybody do like the dog in the back window. Okay, and I've taken the, all of this, all of this as it relates to our purpose as the church, and I've tried to condense it down, and this is what we came up with. 
Our purpose is to win and keep souls for Christ. That's job one. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's job one. Winning souls is job one. Everything else is secondary. Can, now, I really hope that we can understand this. Brother, I'll tell you what. I don't know if I can stand behind this pulpit. Can I get a wireless? Somebody's hooked me up with a wireless mic. I think we had one last night for Brother Campbell. Did you have a wireless mic? Yeah, okay. I would really like to get away from this pulpit a little bit. I'm excited about seeing souls saved, and I hope you're excited as well. I hope this is just as exciting to you as it is to me. Praise the Lord. All right. Get us hooked up there. See if that's got me. All right. I appreciate that. That feels a lot better. Okay. Go ahead and get that volume set. I kind of yell sometimes. All right. Uh, I don't know if y'all know who uh, Hudson Taylor is or was, but he was uh, a missionary to the nation of China. He went to China, and actually he was very re revolutionary in his methods because what he did was he didn't do like the missionaries before him had done, where they had gone and they had kept their British uh, suits and, and their top hats and everything that they would wear as part of the uh, normal fashion of the country that they were originally from. Uh, and they would try to impose their practices and customs on the people that they were missionaries to. But instead, Hudson Taylor did something different because, see, when they went there and they didn't relate to the people that they were trying to uh, win, uh, they weren't very effective. If that country wanted to become westernized, so to speak, wanted to become like the uh, uh, nation of England, then they, they would accept it. But when he, took, uh, when he went to China, he saw that the only way that he could be effective was to become Chinese. So he started dressing like a Chinese. He started eating uh, food that the Chinese ate. He lived in the same kind of homes that the Chinese lived in. And when you see a picture of him, uh, he started as a young man. He was there for some 50 years. Uh, he had, when he was old, he had a long beard, and he looked Chinese. He spoke Chinese. And he completely immersed himself into the culture of the, of the Chinese people and the reason why was because of the Great Commission. This is what he thought about the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Yeah. How many know that it is a command? Yeah. Uh, when uh, anybody here uh, ever been in the military? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your service. When you received a commission, what was that? It was a set of orders, wasn't it? That's what the word commission literally means. It means, uh, you know, in the army, they would call marching orders. And, and that's what a commission is. It's a set of orders. It's a command. It's something that is given to a person, and they are expected to obey. And so the great commission that we hear of, expressed in Matthew, the 28th chapter, and Mark, the 16th chapter, is a command. A command that Jesus himself gave to his disciples. And let's not forget who the disciples were. That, they were that handful of corn that was planted in a mountain. They were the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. The church that Jesus Christ established. So when he, he gave that command, that great commission, he gave it to his church. Amen? Amen? Now, oh my son, y'all just going to let that sit up there and let me not notice it, aren't you? That's what, you, that's what happens when you get all this free software or what they call free on a new computer. They like to tell you about it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 18. Luke 
Luke, the 18th chapter. We're going to be taking a look at some verses here. And what we're going to actually take a look at is a group of people that we find in the scriptures called the Pharisees. Anybody ever hear of a Pharisee? Okay. Let me just talk a little bit about who the Pharisees were and what they were. The Pharisees were a sect of Jews. They, uh, they followed a certain religious order. They were real big on traditionalism, on tradition, especially as it related to uh, external righteousness. They were real careful about where they went, what they touched, uh, what they ate out of, the dishes that they ate out of, the clothes that they would wear, all these things. They were real careful about all this, and they were particularly careful about the people that they associated with. See, they, they considered themselves better than others. And they thought it was something noble on their part, righteous on their part, to keep themselves from having contact with certain people, namely uh, Gentiles, sinners, publicans, and anyone that wasn't as righteous as they were in their minds, in their eyes. Verse 9, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. The two parts of this verse that I look at is I look at what it says here. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Trusted in themselves. And then the last part of that verse, and despised others. Doesn't that word despise sound pretty rough? What, what if I came up to Brother Campbell and said, Brother Campbell, or Campbell, I despise you. <laughs> that sounds pretty rough, doesn't it? Tim Griffith, I despise you. It's like calling him a downright dirty dog, didn't I? I mean, I, I just treated him like he was just not even a person when I said that. And so this is the parable that he gave, because he was talking to people that felt just that kind of way about others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Do you see what it says? With himself. He wasn't even praying to God, was he? He was praying with himself. I don't even know how you do that. How do you pray with yourself? You know, you know usually when you're praying with a brother or sister, you put your arm around them. I guess he did this. Prayed with himself. Prayed with himself. And he said, says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. You see what he's saying? He, he was there to pray, and I don't know, I think he waited until somebody else came up too to pray. Because he wasn't going to waste a good prayer on himself. He was going to make sure somebody else heard it. You see what it says? He says he stood. You know, he wasn't down there hunched over where somebody couldn't hear what he was saying. He stood up so that he could broadcast this prayer out. I mean, he was kind of rolling a prayer and a testimony all in one. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. It says, I fast... In the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, 
God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Which prayer do you think God heard? Did he hear the Pharisee's prayer? Or did he hear the sinner's prayer? This is what Jesus said. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now see, this is how God thinks. This is how God thinks, and this is how God wants us to be. I'm sorry. Somebody put some white tape up here. I can't go that far. <laughs> That's how God wants us to be. That's how God wants us to think of others. Now, I'm hoping this sinks in. If you were nodding off, then you can nod off now because I want you to remember what I just said. Somebody right now is wanting to nudge the person next to him and say, what did he say? What did he say? So I'll say it again. This is how God wants us to think of others. This is what God wants our attitude towards others to be. Not that we are self-righteous or that we are anything special, but that, he, that we have the same care and concern for others less fortunate than ourselves. As God does. God loves them. So should we. God loves them so much that he sent his only begotten son into this world to hang on a cross, a rugged cross, to die for all the sins of all the sinners in all the world. That's how much God loves them. And that's how much we need to love them. Now, I, you know, we've been talking about the Pharisees, and we're talking about Pharisees 2,000 years ago, and some people might think, well, who cares about that? That's an ancient history. But let me ask you this question here. Can, do you know people in church that don't want those nasty, filthy, disgusting, sinful people in their church? I remember one time going to a church and a sinner came in and wanted to just kind of sneak in because they were ashamed, but they were seeking God. And they wanted to be able to come in and very quietly without too much notice, slip in on the back row of the church. But they couldn't do it. Because the church, that church, filled, in, filled up from the back forward. The back pew was the one that was filled up first. And that sinner had to walk down almost all the way to the front row before they could find an empty seat the whole time hanging their head down like that publican we just read about. And then somebody leaned over to that sinner and said, don't you know how you're supposed to dress when you come to the house of God? They were wearing cut-off jeans, shorts, or old raggedy shirt with no sleeves. Exposing themselves in places they shouldn't expose themselves. But it's the best that they had. It was their normal attire. And they were just about told to leave and don't come back until you can look decent. Where's the love? Where's the concern? Let's go back a few chapters. Let's go to Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter, and, and it's interesting here because this whole 14th chapter is talking about some of the same things that the 18th chapter was talking about. It's talking about the Pharisees. If you look at the first verse there, it tells it that Jesus was in the home of a Pharisee. 
Jesus was in the home of a Pharisee. There was a man that uh, had the dropsy, which was uh, a, a, the body was swollen, especially the face was swollen. And uh, it was very painful, and, and, and this person was in great misery. And Jesus knew the hearts of those Pharisees that were gathered there. He knew what they were thinking on their hearts. And so he says, should a, a man be healed on the Sabbath day? <laughs> he kind of flipped the tables on them. He heals the man and he talks about it and he talks about giving preference to others. Being concerned for others. He says when you go to a, the, your rich uh, friend's house and they have a big party and you think you, because you're the best friend of this person, you think you ought to have the best seat in the house. He says, give that seat to somebody else. Take the lowest seat. Let that person come that's bidden thee and take you up to the front rather than assuming that you have the highest seat and they ask you to give that seat to another and you end up having to take the lowest seat. Right. Let others exalt yourself. Exalt you and don't do it yourself. He started talking to them about humility. Look at verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Call those that wouldn't even think that they would ever get an invitation to your house. Now, think about this for a minute here. In fact, really, if we look at it, because the Pharisees were one of the high religious orders of the day. They were the very religious people. And so in many respects, we can consider ourselves. In fact, I think that when Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, he was talking, he says, don't have the kind of attitude that they have. You're, you're going to be prone to it. It's possible that you could have this. Don't let it happen. He was saying that to his new converts, to those that accepted him as Messiah. And so I think we need to take the same warning. Verse 21, are you reading in your Bibles? Okay. Verse 21, now this is where Jesus gave, was giving another parable. And he was talking about a rich man that, that wanted to have a, a feast. And so he invited all those that he knew, but many that he invited make, made excuses. I've Bought some oxen. I've got to try them out. I've, I've bought some land that I need to go and inspect. I've just got married. I've got to tend to my wife. You know wives are high maintenance. <laughs> you know what I just saw? I saw all the ladies go, hmm. And I saw all the guys go, mm-hmm. <laughs> the verse I'm wanting us to look at is what he said about this. It says, then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. I need four volunteers very quickly. Very quickly. Otherwise, you're not going to get to eat. I need one more. All right. Come on. Come on. All right. All right. Oh, I got five. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, y'all just line up right here. Okay. All right, brother, you're poor. So. Okay. You hold your hand out there because you're poor. You're wanting somebody to give you something, right? All right. Okay. Brother, you're maimed. Okay, so, you know, just kind of, you know, you, you do that so well. Okay. I'm old. Brother? I'm old. Okay. All right. I tell you what, I, I'm going to let him trade places because he makes a better halt person than he does a maimed. Okay, you're doing a good maimed. Okay, you're maimed. Come on now, you're maimed. All right, 
Your halt. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. And you're blind, so just cover your hand. Put your hand over your eyes. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right. All right. The poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Now, now, the thing is, is that there are people just like this, isn't there? How many times are you driving down the road and, and you come up to a traffic light and there's somebody standing there with a piece of cardboard? What do they say? Well, you don't know because you never did look in their direction. You never read their sign. You know what it said. You've seen them before, but you ignore them, don't you? Come on now. We do. We do. We do this. We ignore them. Because a lot of times we think what? They're faking. They're out there conning people. Oh, yeah, there was that thing on 60 Minutes, you know, that guy panhandling in New York City, holding doors open for people and telling them, God bless you, every time they walked in. He was making $200 a day doing that. So all people like this are faking it. There ain't a one of them that's really poor. Isn't that what we think? Or, or how about that one... This maimed. Now, now, you know, this is funny, and you're doing a great job. You really are. You really are. But have you ever seen somebody that was maimed? Have you seen someone who lost his legs? Lost his legs. I'll tell you what would happen to me if I lost my legs. I'd be having me a pity party in the dark or somewhere where you wouldn't see me. But you know where? You've seen some people that were maimed out there doing as much as they physically could do. I saw a man. In fact, he, he's an actor. He's an actor. He was in, you might have seen him in the movie uh, called, uh, it's, the movie's entitled Amazing Grace. Okay, and it's the history of the hymn, where the hymn came from. And there's a man in there. And it was not... Computer-generated special effects. He was missing his body from here down. From here down. Yeah. I mean, that's a wonder he's surviving. He has almost no digestive system. But you know what he's got? He's got a little piece of plywood with wheels on it, a little dolly, and he pushes himself all over town with that thing. The poor, the maimed, the halt. You ever, you know, my father had a stroke and was paralyzed on the left side of his body for the last eight years of his life. For eight years, this arm just hung there like this, just kind of half bent. When he'd sit down, he'd have to pull it up and set it in his lap. When he'd get up, it'd just fall down. It was still attached, but it wouldn't go anywhere. It wouldn't do anything. But my dad learned to compensate for that. His left leg, same way. He'd wear a brace on it to keep it stiff. And he'd kind of almost use it like a crutch. He'd walk with a cane on one side. The poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. I don't see anybody here that's blind. Maybe you can't see too well, but you see well enough. I don't see any C&I dogs. I don't see any white canes. Everybody here can see well enough to get around. Or you've got somebody with you to help you. Now these are people that for the most part, there's nothing that they could possibly do about their circumstances. Is that right? Is that right? And what did Jesus say in his parable to these Pharisees that sought so highly of themselves and despised others? He tells this story. This master wanted his house filled. He says, 
Go out quickly. There's that word go. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. That's where the homeless people live. And bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. You see, this master of this house knew that they were out there. He didn't ignore them. He didn't say, well, let somebody else take care of them. Let them find some help somewhere else. But he said, I have much to share. Bring them in. Do you see where he told his servant, now don't bring in too many of them. Just a token amount. Just, just one of each. That, that's a good amount. Yeah, well, I, you know, for a Pharisee, that'd be great. Pharisee, he'd be thinking real highly of himself. <laughs> Look at mine. Look what I got. But in the parable that Jesus gave, this man who had such abundance, he says, bring them all in. Bring them all in. Go out quickly. Find them. Look for them. Go into the streets and lanes of the city. Find them. Bring them in. Bring them hither. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. There's a song that says, bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in. Bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. And we sing that song and we're sounding so good. And I think, are we thinking about what we're singing? You know what? Let me just tell you this here. I'm going to let y'all sit down just a minute, but y'all are doing such a great job. And y'all are helping me so much. I think y'all just need to stay there for a minute. Brother Ryan's still blind over there. No, 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 uh-uh. They don't get a break, you don't get a break. You can watch it on DVD later. The thing about it is, is that what Jesus was teaching them was that God wants everyone in his house. Oh, God wants everyone in his house. And let me just say this right now. I, I'm not going to ask for any show of hands, pastors, because this would be too embarrassing. I know it would be for me, so I know it would be for you. But how many times do we have to fill out our ministry support each month and put those great big goose eggs in the blanks. Big zeros. Zero, zero, zero. We'll put on the, you know, the sermon line 10 sermons, 12 sermons, 15 sermons. Saved, zero. Sanctified, zero. Filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, zero. Added to the church, zero. Baptized in water, zero. Number of homes visited, zero. Oh, I mean, um, I hope not. I hope not. See, that's that keeping part. Winning and keeping souls. But if we wanted to have people in church this next Sunday, and we purposed that we were going to go out into the streets of the lanes of the city and we were going to find the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Do you think we could find some? Do you think we could fill up our cars? Do you think we could fill up a few at church? Do you feel like we might could even fill up the whole house of God? I'm not getting too many amens, but I'm getting a few. Could we do it? Sure could. In fact, if we found that person and we saw, saw that poor person there, you don't have one of those. I'll give it back to you. If we saw that poor person with that cardboard sign that says, hungry, will work for food. If we said, come to church with me, we'll, we'll get you fed. You think they'd come? Probably it'd be a pretty good test. If they're faking it, they're going to say no. If they really mean it, they're going to say, I sure will. That maimed person, 
You think they'll come to church if you invite them? Sure. Or that halt person? Or that blind person? You think if we invited them to come to our house? You know, maybe a church might be a little too, you know, uncomfortable for them. But if we were to say, hey, would you like a bed to sleep in tonight? Now, I'm getting serious, folks. You want a bed to sleep in tonight? I've got a spare one in my house. Oh, Brother Shaw, you don't know what you're asking for when you do things like that. Brother Shaw, they'll rob you blind. No, they won't. They're already blind. They'll hurt you. No, they're already hurt. They're hurt themselves. All right, brother, y'all have done such a fine job. I'm going to let y'all sit down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> See, the thing about it is, is that God wants to fill his house. God wants to fill his house. And if we're saying, well, brother Shaw, tell us some ways to fill fill the house because see what happened was is the servant said Lord it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room was that enough well, they went into the city found every lame maimed halt and blind there was found every one of them brought them in but there was still room oh aren't you glad that there's still room aren't you glad there's still room you know what? The only reason why we're still here is because there's still room in heaven. The only reason why that we're still here is because there's still some more out there that God wants in His house. I need an amen on that one. It's the only reason why we've not been taken out of this world is because God says there's still more that I want you to get. How many want to get to heaven? Not tonight. Just how many want to get there? Okay. Now, if we're serious... You know, you know what the Bible says? Even so, Lord, come quickly. That's the way they did it. When they would greet each other, we, you know, we'd say hello and, and good evening and good morning and all this kind of thing. You know what they said? They said, Maranatha. Yeah. You know what that means? He's coming. Yeah. The Lord cometh. He's coming. That's how they greeted each other. That's how much they were anticipating the rapture. That's how eager they were to get to heaven. Do you know what? God says, not yet, not yet, not yet. There's still room in my house. There's still room in my house. And it says, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. See, the highways, those were the, the, the roads that connected the cities, the towns. That was out in the country, out in the boonies. In other words, you found them all that you could find, go out farther. Go out farther and find them. Go as far as you can because I want my house filled. And then the last thing he says is, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The very ones that had the opportunity, that were first invited, they missed out. I worry about that sometimes. I worry about that. Because I kind of read between the lines a little bit here. And I kind of think what he's saying is, I've given you your marching orders. I've given you the command. I've given you the great commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. If you don't, there may not be room for you. you may not get an invitation. That's a pretty sobering thought to think that it might be that way. Who is the ye in go ye? Ye is me. Say that with me. Ye, do, point, point to yourself when you say it. Ye is me. See, it's not the preachers, it's not the Sunday school teachers, it's not the band leaders, it's not uh, the ones that have been in church for 25 years or raised in the church all their lives. 
It's not me. It's everybody else. Mm -mm. Ye means me. That's talking about us. We're the ones that Jesus instructed to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. A.J. Tomlinson believed this, and he had a saying that was very popular. Every member a worker and a special work for everyone. Every member a worker. Every member a worker. Everybody that's a member of the church of God, would you raise up your hand? You need to be a worker. Well, I'm 70 years old. Doesn't that exclude me? Well, I'm a busy person. Doesn't that exclude me? Sister might say, well, I'm just a, a woman. Does that exclude me? Somebody might say, well, I'm not educated. Does that exclude me? Somebody might say, here's the one you hear so often. Oh, I'm not called. I'm not called. There was one person missing up here. I'm not called. Because they wouldn't listen when God called them. See, God calls every one, of us, every one of us the moment that we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts. Amen. At that point, if we are to become a Christian, that means that we become Christ-like. We become like Him. That means that we've got a responsibility to take the message of love, the same love that we have received. We're supposed to take that message to a lost and dying world. Every member working for souls, every member a soul winner, Every person here, every person in your local church, every person in your family, every person that's saved, every person that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God has called us to be soul winners. Right. Our purpose is to win and keep souls for Christ. All right, very quickly. How much time have I got? Am I about 10 minutes over? Okay, I'm right there. Okay, good. Can I have five minutes? I'll, do, I'll see if I can do it in three. All right, here's how to be a soul winner. How many would like to be a soul winner? Would you raise your hand? Would you really like to win souls? All right, now, if you're honest with me and yourself, would you raise that hand again if you say, I don't feel like I'm as prepared to be a soul winner as I could be? I've got my hand up. Sure. That's how we normally feel. What's the number one thing that keeps us from being a soul winner? We're scared. Yeah. Why? Well, if I was to go up to someone and try to witness to them, I might be embarrassed. Seriously, what is the worst thing that could happen to you? They might curse at you. That happens every day. All kinds of people curse at me all the time. Usually in my rearview mirror. <laughs> so how do we overcome that? Well, here's, here's one thing. You know, the Bible says that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we get into God's word, everybody that's got a Bible, would you be proud enough to hold it up for a moment? All right. If that's a brand new Bible, would you take your hand down, please? If it's a Bible that's getting kind of worn, would you hold it up proudly? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, this here is about my third Thompson Chain Bible, Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And it, it's kind of showing some wear and tear already. That's not bragging. That's not bragging. Study the, the, how to use the Bible to witness, and then pray for boldness. Pray for boldness. You know what? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's no reason for us to be afraid. There's no reason for us to be timid. There's no reason for us to be nervous. But we will be. I promise you we will be. 
You know what? I've taught the people that witness every day that it's their purpose in life to witness to as many people as they possibly can, and they can tell you every time they approach a sinner, they get butterflies in their stomach until they make contact. Somebody else come up here and help me real quick, 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 quick. Hurry up or I'm going to lose my time. Somebody. Brother Tim, come up here. Brother Tim, come on, hurry. Yeah, I know it. Okay, you're a sinner. You know, what happens is this here. Butterflies, butterflies, butterflies. Hey there, how you doing? Gone. See, because we're over here, we're saying, Lord, Lord, you're directing me to witness to this person. Lord, I'm, I'm nervous. Lord, you've got to go with me. Lord, you promised in your word you'd go with me. And, and we, we, over, we take that step of faith. We, take that, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We take that step of faith, and just as soon as we approach that person and we begin to engage them in conversation, those butterflies just disappear. They do. Now, if I'm wrong, you try it and see. You try it, and if it doesn't work that way for you, you come tell me. Thank you, Brother Tim. I appreciate it. All right, pray for boldness. Look for opportunities to witness. Don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. Purpose to work for souls. There was a man, I'm trying, I've been trying to find the account that I read this in. I don't know if it was uh, D.L. Moody. I think it might have been D.L. Moody. I'm not certain, though. But what he did was he purposed that he was going to witness to somebody every single day. At least one person every single day. And one day, he, had, uh, he was real busy that day doing a lot of things. And he got into his home and it was late in the evening. It was like 10 o'clock at night. And he suddenly remembered that he hadn't witnessed to a person that day. And it gripped his heart. And he couldn't stand it. He couldn't let that night go by. He couldn't let that day pass without having fulfilled his promise to the Lord. And so he put on his coat, and he went out into the dark city, and he looked for the first person he could find. And he came to a man standing on a street corner, fixing to cross the street. And he came up to him and said, Sir, if you were to die tonight, would you be prepared to meet your, meet your maker? And the man says this, How indignant! How dare you ask me such a private and personal question? And he put him down. D.L. Moody just left and went on back home. He had fulfilled his promise, but he was broken, crushed, because the man wouldn't even have a conversation about it with him. Three days later, 10 o'clock at night, he gets a knock on the door. He opens the door. Who would be knocking on his door at 10 o'clock at night? He opened that door, and there was that very same gentleman that he had witnessed to three nights before, and he says, I've not been able to rest ever since you asked me that question. Please tell me what I must do to be saved. Oh, see, God, he goes with us. He prepares the way. He, he, if we will purpose to work for souls, God will make a way. God will equip us. God will provide for us. God will go before us and prepare the way. And then lastly, I think we need to be an example. I learned this a long time ago because one time I witnessed to somebody. I witnessed to a friend of mine. And that friend seemed interested in what I was saying. And I, and I wasn't able to get him to commit to the Lord that day. And, but he did say that he would come to church sometime. Well, that very next service, I think the next service coming was a Wednesday night. And I had worked real hard that day. And I thought, well, you know, it's auxiliary night. There won't hardly be anybody there, just the old faithful few. And, you know, I've worked awfully hard today, and I think I just need to rest up because I've got to work again tomorrow. And so I justified in my own mind staying out of church that night. The next day... One of the people, one of those faithful few that went to church gave me a call. He said, Brother Shaw, so-and-so came to church last night and they were looking for you. We had to tell them we didn't know why you weren't there. Is everything okay? Are you all right? Are you sick? 
And I had to just say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. See, we have to be an example of the believers. We have to be an example of what it means to be a believer. We need to be an example, especially to those that we witness to. If we're actively witnessing, if we're act actively working for souls, those souls are going to come. We better be a good example to them. And then also, we need to be an example to others. You want to get a church fired up, become a soul winner, and watch it become contagious. Suddenly, everybody's out there winning souls. All right. Now, as the evangelism coordinator for the Heartland region, I am making this offer. I will come to your church for a week-long revival and personal evangelism workshop. And this is here kind of the way it lays out, okay? I'm talking about jam-packed because I'm not going to come to your house and just fellowship. I know, you know you'll probably put me up in your best room. I appreciate that. You're going to feed me the best meals I've ever had in my life. I appreciate that. But I'm not there to fellowship. I'm there to help work for souls. I'm there to help train your congregation to work for souls. How many would like to have a whole church full of soul winners? Pastors? How would you like to have a whole church full of soul winners? Isn't that really what we'd love to have? That's almost like a, a Christmas wish. That we know there's no way we'd ever have it. But you know what? It's possible. It sure is. Oh, it's possible. This is how it works out. Now, I would come on a Saturday. Most of them will start on a Sunday. But see, I'm there to have workshops and to teach your congregation how to witness, how to be personal soul winners. Saturday, we'll conduct an evangelism workshop, soul winning workshop during the day. Nighttime, we have a revival service, okay? Sunday, we'll have revival service in the morning, and then we'll do an altar working workshop in the afternoon and have revival meeting that evening. And then Monday, we'll go out and we'll do some street witnessing, some outdoor evangelism. Uh, see, all these things are different. You do things differently for different groups and for different settings. And if we're witnessing the people, guess what? We're probably going to have some people come to church that night. So we'll have revival that night. Tuesday, the pastor's going to give me all your shut-ins, all of the sick, all the uh, ones that have lost contact with the church, and we're going to try to find them. We're going to see where they went. We're going to seek them out. We're going to go into the streets and lanes of the city and find them. We're going to go into the highways and hedges and find them and bring them in to God's house for revival service that night. We'll do that again Wednesday and Thursday. And then Friday, we'll do some more street witnessing, witnessing outside. And see, everybody's going to be doing this. And especially your young people. You want to have a charged up uh, youth group in your church? Train them to be soul winners. Equip them. Give them the tools to be able to be soul winners. Now, this here is, the, is really the best case scenario. And, and as far as the finances are concerned, uh, the way I feel about it, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Okay? I'll do this. You don't have to be 50 people or 100 people for me to come. If it's three people, I'll come. If it's one person, I'll come. We'll go out and we'll win the rest of them. Isn't that exciting? All right? If all we've got time for is a weekend, we're going to jam-pack it as much as we can into those three days. We'll start on a Friday, finish over the weekend. How many would like to do that? Wouldn't you like to do that? Isn't that exciting to think about equipping your church to be a soul-winning soul church? All right, last thing. I've got some tools. All right. First thing we need is we need to learn the scriptures that we need to use to witness. There's a whole page of them. This uh, list of scriptures for you to memorize or at least read and study and mark in your Bible will be here on the back table. There's also some other resources that we'll be giving you. Let's go out and win souls for Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother.